don't have the time for stupid toys. Yo, what's going on, E7 fam? Pat here, back with another How to Play video. And this one, we'll be talking about the much requested Blood Moon Haste. This is probably the first time in like three years that Haste Lennox or any version of him has been meta relevant. And honestly, this is one of the strongest characters I think we've ever gotten for any playstyle. So it's no wonder why you all requested to see a guide for him this time. But before we get into the equipment breakdowns and skill breakdowns and things like that, make sure to help me appease the algorithm gods by leaving a like or subscribing to the channel if you're not already. It costs you nothing and it helps me out here a ton. With my introduction out of the way now, let's jump right into it, starting with Haste stats. Blood Moon Haste is a Dark Soul Weaver of the Pisces Zodiac symbol, which means she shares a stat line with Rowana and Ruel of Light. Taking a closer look at his stats, he has 621 attack, 802 defense, 5474 health, 102 speed, 15% critical hit chance, 150% critical hit damage, no starting effectiveness, and 12% starting effect resistance. The standouts in the stat line are, of course, the higher than 0% starting effect resistance, and the 802 defense, which is the highest amongst all five stars in Epic 7. The drawbacks here being the really bad 621 attack, which doesn't usually matter because this is a health scaling character, as you'll find out in the next section, but the 102 base speed definitely hurts. It's on the much slower end compared to average characters in Epic 7. As a bit of trivia before moving on to the skill section, in the English dub of Epic 7, Haste, as well as Blood Moon Haste, is voiced by the amazing Abby Trot, who is also the voice of Clarissa and Kitty Clarissa. She's one of the only voiceover artists that Epic 7 has personally done a voiceover spotlight for. You can also hear her as the voice of Gwen from League of Legends, Nezuko from Demon Slayer, and she is the current voice of Wonder Woman appearing in Multiverses, which currently just had a release. In the Japanese dub of Epic 7, however, Blood Moon Haste is voiced by Ayumu Murase, who you could hear as Venti in Genshin Impact, Kage in Ranking of Kings, and of course his most famous role is that of Hinata Shoyo from Haikyuu. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty stoked for that movie later this week. You are not worthy of my courtesy. Before we talk about Blood Moon Haste attacks, we first have to talk about his passive skill, Grudge, Otherwise, the multipliers might not make a ton of sense to you. You see, Grudge states that whenever Blood Moon Haste attacks, he penetrates the target's defense by 100%, but none of his moves can land a critical hit. Grudge also states that when an ally dies, it grants a barrier and immunity to all allies for two turns, as well as grants the unique and undispellable buff Blood Aura to Blood Moon Haste for two turns. The barrier on this passive is proportional to 30% of Blood Moon Haste's maximum health. Blood Aura states that Blood Moon Haste gets 30% extra effectiveness and a 30% speed increase. And Blood Aura also states that his S3 is now kind of ridiculous, but we'll talk more about that in just a minute. The important part to take away here from Grudge is that, well, all of your moves deal true damage and that the barrier from it poses a very, very serious roadblock to a lot of aggressive compositions. You see, they're going to need to focus Blood Moon Haste first and foremost. Or at least hit him and the rest of his team with some kind of unbuffable to prevent the actual buffs triggering from Grudge. If they don't do either of those things, well then they're essentially going to have to deal with a whole extra body's worth of health. Three barriers worth 30% of Haste maximum HP is basically a whole extra character. This fact, plus again that skill 3 that I'm alluding to that we'll talk about a little bit later, makes Haste an excellent character for stabilizing versus aggression. And now that you understand that everything is true damage, you can kind of expect a lot of 0.3x attack multipliers on the rest of this stuff because that's kind of standard when something does true damage. Moving on to Blood Moon Haste skill 1, it is Blood Scythe. It is a single target attack with a 0.3x attack multiplier as well as a 12% max health multiplier. It has a 100% chance to dispel one buff from the target. Would you like to be my next meal? Additionally on Blood Scythe, if it does actually succeed in stripping a buff, it will activate Bloody Retribution as an extra attack. Bloody Retribution is also a single target attack with a 0.3x attack multiplier, as well as a slightly lower 10% max health multiplier. 
This move heals not only Blood Moon Haste, but the rest of his team for 10% of Blood Moon Haste maximum health. Do note that counters and dual attacks that strip buffs can proc Bloody Retribution, making both the counter set and the unity set strong choices that we'll definitely be talking about in the character build section. Bloody Retribution also procs on-hit artifacts such as Celestine. This again further solidifies counter as a strong choice, since players are naturally going to want to focus Blood Moon Haste so as to avoid triggering his passive Grudge. Finally, we come to Blood Moon Haste, skill 3, in Moon Slash. You acquire 3 souls upon use, and it has a 4-5 to five turn cooldown depending on Malagora. It is a single target attack that dispels all buffs from the enemy before it deals damage. If an enemy is defeated by Moon Slash, it revives all dead allies and grants them immortality for one turn. If that wasn't enough, this move also does double damage if Blood Moon Haste has the Blood Aura passive. Is that all you're capable of? Then you're better off dead. Very appetizing, but oh well. Moonslash always did good true damage, somewhere around 7,000 to 12,000 on Blood Moon Haste based on his build as well as his artifact. And then for some reason, they raised the damage by about 15% on the HP scaling and gave it a clause that somehow doubles the damage. All of that in and of itself is pretty terrifying because you're looking already at a 20k plus true damage nuke. But remember, this thing now gives a full team revive if it actually scores a kill. And since Blood Aura basically guarantees a kill, well that guarantees a revive. You can kind of start to see why this character is pretty strong. If you don't focus down haste or have a way to circumvent the Blood Aura passive on him, he will undo all of your hard work. He is a roadblock and a wall that players have to find a way to get around. And we'll touch more on ways to do that in his bad matchups later on in the matchup knowledge section. Finally, in this section, let's talk about his Soul Burn, which is on his S1 Blood Scythe. For the cost of 10 souls, you ignore effect resistance. This basically guarantees that you will dispel one buff from the target, giving you that follow-up on Bloody Retribution, and giving you that extra healing to your entire team. Because this Soul Burn ignores Effect Resistance, much in the same way that Archdemon Shadow's Soul Burn ignores Effect Resistance, I don't really see effectiveness as super important on the character. You can have some, but between the Blood Aura giving 30% and this Soul Burn ignoring ER, I just don't think it's worth focusing for like 100 or 150% on the character. The Soul Burn is designed to make that something that you don't really need, and instead you'd be better off I think focusing on something like say extra bulk, or possibly even effect resistance, so that, that way you don't get hit with the dreaded unbuffable debuff, which is something that this character is super, super weak against. When it comes to Mulligora priorities, I think you want to be maxing the S3 Moonslash first, not only for the cooldown, but the damage. If this move doesn't secure a kill, well then you don't get that team revive, which is kind of what makes this character super scary. After that, max out the S2 Grudge for the barrier strength, that way if somebody decides to not focus down haste, you can make it as punishing as possible, as hard as possible to deal damage to your team. After that, we have the S1, which is just a damage increase, so for most players, you can most likely forego it. They might as well call Blood Moon Haste Mr. Universal, because he's got the same universal build regardless of playstyle, whether that's cleave, aggro, or standard. And all of this is largely due to the factors that we talked about in the previous section. Remember, Haste can't critically strike due to his passive grudge, so critical hit chance and damage are basically worthless. And as we talked about with the Soul Burn, Effectus isn't really worth it either, because you could just Soul Burn it, and if you wanted to do it early, just bring a Mage with Ancient Book. Stopping him from getting Blood Aura is a crucial way to counterplay the character, and your two best options for doing that are 1. Bursting him down, or 2. Hitting him with Unbuffable so that his passive can't give him Blood Aura in the first place, thus denying him the bonus damage to Moon Slash. All of this together translates to a character that only needs 4 stats, health and defense to survive, 
effect resistance to deal with the unbuffable problem, and speed. You need to strike a balance between all four of them if you want to have the best performance. In this section, I'll show you the most commonly played stat line on the character as of the recording of this video, as well as the effect resistance slant that players have chosen to run it with. If you're feeling a bit more experimental though, we'll talk about some of the other options you can use afterwards. For now, let's talk sets. For four piece sets, counter is a no brainer in my opinion. Speed or protection could work, but giving up the value of a counter bloody retribution is a lot. That's two true damage attacks and potentially up to three heals on your team, depending on the artifact. That is game deciding. I personally think counter is the best choice overall for the character, but use whichever set you like. As for two piece sets, health gives you the most amount of healing, bulk, and true damage from your counters, although resistance could work if you are trying to build that effect resistance. Immunity and unity are other potential options depending on your preferences. As for stats, the general three numbers that I see on average are about 1800 defense, 22k HP, and about 180 speed average. These are not set in stone. Feel free to mess around with them. 1800 defense should be relatively easy to get on Blood Moon Haste thanks to having the highest defense stat in the game. 22k is usually the floor that I see and some of the best ones have over 25k HP. I personally run around 24k HP, but as you could tell, I have a triple imprint uh, Blood Moon Haste, so yeah, that kind of helps for quite a lot. Uh, speed, again, 180 is about the average. Feel free to go as low as like say 160 or so if you so choose. And the fastest ones I've seen are around 200 to 210 plus speed. But those ones are usually on the speed set because they don't have the gear to play the character on counter set. These three numbers are the core in my opinion. As for effect resistance, 100 plus is usually recommended or even 130 plus if you can get it. Just whatever you can get with high effect resistance without impacting your bulk stats too much. That's what you're looking for. Taking a look at the right side pieces, I am on a health percentage neck and health percentage ring and the boots are speed. And here are the recommended per piece average is for this stat line, 21% health, 17% defense, seven speed. And if you're going for that 100% effect resistance, then it will be 15% effect resistance per piece average. This is in total how most of the player base is playing the character currently as I am recording this video. As for artifacts, Celestine is gonna be my recommendation and the one that I use for all of my calculations. The fact that a counter can result in not only two true damage attacks plus an AoE heal is already massive as I've already explained. If both of those attacks also give you two more healing procs though, yeah, again, that's game decided. That said, it's depending on you actually getting a counter proc and actually landing a strip. That's RNG at the end of the day. So if you want something more consistent, Idol's Cheer might be something that's really good for you, especially since haste is going to be constantly focused down. This one is, I think, also really good in general for people who are trying to play this character as a cleave character, like a cleave anchor, or in just a very aggressive playstyle overall. These are both five-star artifacts, though, and I recognize this, so if you're looking for a budget option, Water's Origin is definitely, I think, the go-to there. As I mentioned earlier, there are definitely alternate possibilities to take this character. You have a lot of flexibility with your right side pieces. If you don't really want to play effect resistance because either one, you can't get the gear, or two, you just think 100 ER doesn't really do anything in 2024, then feel free to swap your boots from speed to health percentage and chase more HP. Something like say 1800 defense and 24.5 or 25k plus HP and keep the speed the same. You could also go for more effectiveness, which I'm not really somebody that is a fan of that. As we talked about, you could just use the soul burn to get around it, but I have seen people actually go for it. Instead of going for 100% effect resistance, they went for 100% effectiveness so that that way they might not necessarily need the soul burn on the character. There's also the possibility of dropping the speed down from like 180-ish to like 150 maybe, and going for again, health percentage boots, or maybe even like an effect resistance ring with health percentage boots. Like I said, all of this is at the end of the day, kind of the same build on counter. It's just how you decide to allocate these bonus stats that you would normally invest into higher effect resistance, higher speed, higher health. 
As always, let's round out this video with some matchup knowledge. In the character build section, I joked about how Blood Moon Haste was Mr. Universal. Same Universal build, regardless of playstyle, right? And that's true, he's just universally good in almost any scenario as of the recording of this video. Just take a look at the Cleave match, for example. If you are the Cleaver, you can take Blood Moon Haste as an anchor against a character like I, Karina. Now, traditionally, if you try to cleave a Karina, she will just reverse sweep you with her S3. I'll blow you away. Trying to do that against Blood Moon Haste, though, and killing the rest of his teammates triggers Grudge, and, well, then he could just turn around, use Moon Slash with Blood Aura, and one-shot the character and completely stabilize the cleave. On the reverse hand, if you are getting cleaved, you can take Blood Moon Haste, and depending on how things pan out, if they kill other teammates on your team and Haste still survives, Grudge gives you a massive barrier, and then you can stabilize again with Moon Slash and just undo all of their hard work from cleaving. That's not to say that this character is without faults, however. Savior Auden and Little Queen Charlotte are both two fantastic single target nukers that do bonus damage to dark characters, of which Blood Moon Haste is. So he's super vulnerable to the single target burst that these characters have. And as I've talked about throughout the video, Unbuffable really does a number on this character. You need the bonus damage on Moonslash in order to guarantee that huge nuke into Revive to stabilize a game. Well, there are a lot of characters in the format with Unbuffable that are particularly strong, such as Bihu and Briarwitch Asaria. Asaria in particular does double time duty against Haste because not only does she have the Unbuffable, but should she miss? Well, you can't revive the teammates anyway. And of course, since Blood Moon Haste at the end of the day is a health scaling character, all of his damage and his healing scales off of health, naturally injury is a massive problem for him. Characters like Death Deal Array and of course, Urban Shadow Shu. To wrap up the video, let's talk about some teammates for Blood Moon Haste. As I already alluded to, this character is an amazing safety net for a lot of different styles of compositions. You could take somebody like Ran and execute a cleave, or go with Sea Phantom Politis and try to aggro your opponent down, and know that Blood Moon Haste will stabilize the game he has your back. But what happens if you want somebody to have Blood Moon Haste back, especially if you're somebody who's a bit slower and doesn't play cleave or aggro? You could play general mitigation knights in order to make it harder to burst him down, but I would recommend the newly released Dragon Bride Senya or someone like Ikarina. Both of these characters actively punish your opponent for trying to focus down Blood Moon Haste. And if they're not willing to focus him down, then of course Moon Slash just resets everything and undoes all of their hard work. And of course, to round it out, Haste's other weakness is to Unbuffable, so he's really good with cleansers that make sure that he can actually still get his Blood Aura passive up. Mediator Quaric is still all reliable in this aspect, and of course, what would a list be without the most busted unit in Epic 7 currently? Laia. And that is going to do it for how to play Blood Moon Haste. If I forgot anything, as always, let me know down in the comment section below. And if you want to see more how to play guides in a similar style to this one, there should be a playlist on your screen now. As always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye now.